Well, some things I want to share with you real quick. Number one, I'd ask you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 5. We're going to complete chapter 5 today. Number two, when you walked in the door, if you got a handout, you're going to notice it was only one of them, which is okay, but there's probably more of one of you in your family as opposed to the person that got the handout, and so you may need one of these charts to fill out, and I'm going to ask if you wouldn't mind to raise your hand because this is going to be us documenting the differences between the line of Adam and the line of Christ, and I want to make sure we understand the differences. Now, is, is the second thing that I'm going to be handing out is I'm going to really encourage you, if you have not taken advantage of getting Romans 5 on this piece of paper where it's double-spaced, I'm going to ask you please to take that up today if you would want that because there's some of the things we're going to deal with today that are translation issues and you will want to mark them and you might not have enough room in your Bible to do that. You can never go wrong marking up the text. Well, actually, you can. I don't know if I've told you guys, but the thing I have on the text the most on my handout here is whiteout. That's what I've noticed. I'll come to some sort of conclusion about something. I'm like, oh, that's not right. It's terrible. And then when your whiteout doesn't work, that puts you in the flesh real quick. But anyway. Now, I want to share with you just a couple of verses real quick that Mitch can bring up. We've, we've gotten, and, and this will give us a good start into this so we understand where we're going. The book of Romans is about how do you live by faith? Why is that? Because only the righteous will live by faith. And what's interesting we find out about that righteousness is that righteousness is not just being spoken of as far as your standing before God. Or let me put it this way, you hear the gospel message, you respond in faith, I believe that that is true, and when you do, immediately you are transferred locations to where God has placed you in a position where he has legally declared you as righteous. You are justified, that's what that is, justified. And how are you justified? The work of Jesus Christ, but by faith alone. You've believed in what Jesus has done for you. In fact, if you want to break it down, we're actually saved by works, if you really want to think about it. We're saved by the perfect work of Jesus. This is why our insufficient work never works, and we need somebody else that works. Does that make sense? Okay, you probably have to listen to that one again on the, on the website. But anyway, you get it. Jesus does a perfect work. So with that in mind, God doesn't stop there. God wants to move us forward. And so if we would, Mitch, if you wouldn't mind, can you pull up Romans 1.17? Can you pull that up, please? So here we go. Let's look at this. Actually, it's 16 and 17. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, okay? For, here's the explanation, it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes in the Jew first and also for the Greek. For, for the, Greek. <laughs> the Greek are the ones that we got to worry about. Unbelievable. The Greek. In fact, Mitch, let's show them your new thing that you came up with. Let's make sure I'm sitting in the right place here. Let's show them this. That good? <laughs> he said, can you stand right here just a little bit? I want to show people something. Anyway, this is the serious godly consecration that takes place before we have church, okay? Now, here's a question. The power of God coming through the gospel is a good thing, yes? But how is that power seen? Does anybody know? We covered it not too long ago. Does not God tell Paul, my power is perfected in weakness? See, the actual goal that we're going for in Romans is that Paul wants to show us you don't just need him to get you in the door. You need him throughout your entire life. And he will guarantee that your destination is locked up and finished. Absolutely. Now, we love the whole, thank you God for saving me. We use that word. And if you're in hermeneutics class, you're recognizing that that's not how Paul uses the word save in Romans. But we say, thank you God that I'm justified in your sight because Jesus has done all the work. I'm in the door. And we say, thank you God that I have an eternal destiny that is locked up with you forever because of what Jesus has done. But let's be honest, it's the middle part of living life that we have the most issues with, yes? 
What we're going to see today is that God wants to save us from that situation as well. So if we want to talk about that, notice, for in that the righteousness of God is revealed, it becomes manifested to us. How is that? Notice, from faith to faith, whether you've believed or how you're living, it says here, as it is written, the righteous man, italicized, shall live by faith. How is it that you live the Christian life? The means is one only, by the perfect work and the life of Jesus Christ. But the method that must be employed is faith, 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 faith. The Christian life comes down to a belief or an unbelief issue. Now let me show you the distinction that serves as the trigger that moves us into this whole idea of sanctification. We're going to look real quick. If you've got your papers, you got your Bible open, regardless, we're going to look at Romans 5, verses 9 and 10. And I want you to see this transition. We spent a healthy amount of time with this in hermeneutics class, so I'm not going to hit on it too huge, but I want to show you this. Verse 9, much more then, having now been justified by his blood, that's an already done deal, we shall be, what's the word? We shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. And notice that that's something future. Okay? Justification has removed the penalty of sin. That's death, yes? For all of sin and fall short of the glory of God, for the wages of sin is. We got that. We know that. We understand that. So that's Jesus dealing with it on the cross. And we're justified by faith. But look at verse 10. For, here's the explanation. If while we were enemies, we were reconciled, so brought it back into that right relationship. There's a lot that goes on in that. Forgiveness of sin, declared righteous, having Jesus be the reason why we should be accepted by God. And God says, yeah, come on. That's a good thing. It says here, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled. Watch this. We shall be saved by his life. Now we're stepping into resurrection truth. Now let me say this real quick so that it's clear. According to verse 9, if you are someone who has ongoing sin in your life as a believer in Christ, you can be guaranteed that the wrath of God is against you right now. Now, that doesn't sound like a pleasant thought. You say, wait a second, I thought I was saved and I'm out from under all that. Understand this, just because he brought you into the door doesn't mean that he stops being your father. How do you know a good father? A good father is not just caring. A good father's not just loving. But the scary part about it, and you don't understand this as a child, is a father disciplines those he loves. And God, as a perfect father, has no problem disciplining his kids. And so, when he gets in there for this situation, he wants to keep us out of his wrath. Now, here's the amazing thing. He knows, in and of ourselves, we can't do that. We can't stay on the straight and narrow. How many people this week have prayed for patience? Raise your hand. I'm going to encourage you with this as much, as much encouragement as I can muster. Stop it. You don't have it. Lord, just give me patience. God's not going to give you patience. He's not. He doesn't do that. What he did give you is his son. And guess who's perfectly patient? Jesus. See, I'm so worried about trying to improve Jeremy in every situation. And that's gone really great, by the way. <laughs> that the more I try to improve Jeremy, God is teaching me the lesson of Jeremy ain't going to do. What you need is Jesus. You need Jesus living his life in you, his resurrected life of power in you, and not trying to better yourself. Now, why is that? Because not only did God save us from the penalty of sin, which is death, he now wants to save us from the power of sin when it exercises itself in our lives. Now, this brings us to the transition that we need to pay attention to. You may have this from when we did it on the live stream before. If you don't have this, I would encourage you to turn this over. You know what? We might not even get through this sermon today. That's okay. 
might need you to turn this over on the back so you can write this down. But you have to get this distinction. You need to grasp this distinction we're going to deal with. Mitch, let's bring up the PowerPoint slide. You saw these before, but I added a more cushy background to the back of it, okay? So here's what we have. And I'm going to walk around a little bit. If you're freaked out, just let me know and give me this, okay? And I'll stay away from you. It's totally cool. Sins, plural. You need to understand this. Sins plural. It is the countless offenses that we've committed daily by our individual thoughts, words, and deeds that are offensive to a holy creator of all things. Now, if you don't want to write all that out, that's fine. Mitch is going to put it up on the, on the website under the sermon tab so that you can get that. But I want you to understand is sins are what I do. What I've done that offends God, that's the idea. It's my actions. It's what goes on up here. It's what comes out right here because it all manifests what's really stuck in here. That's what we're dealing with. So we want to understand that it's sins, plural, okay? And the idea of sins runs all the way up until the time we get to Romans chapter 5, verse 8. From 321 to 58, it's a big deal. Why? Because justification has to do with sins, what I've done. And when we talk about being justified and being reconciled, the only way that a destitute, depraved, horrible person like myself, aren't you glad you came to church today, can be put back into a right relationship with God is if what I've done to offend him has been forgiven. The one who is offended can now forgive me because the payment of restitution has been made by his perfect son. Hallelujah, praise God. Now, the second part we need to get is the idea of sin, and that's singular. And the idea is the solitary principle that resides in every person that compels and attracts one to commit sins. In other words, if the sins were the leaves on the tree, you can guarantee that the sin is the root. We sometimes call this the sin nature. Maybe you're more familiar with it that way. We'll say that it springs out of the idea of original sin. So when we're talking about sins, plural, we're talking about needing justification or we need righteousness. But when we're talking about sin, right there, we're talking about that I need to be saved. Saved from what? The power of sin in me that wants me to sin all the time. Now, some of us often live in what we feel like is just this slow funneling pool that's slowly going to drag us down like we can never get our heads above water and we can never live a victorious life. And so from 512 on, we're talking about the necessary elements that we need to understand so that Christ is victorious in our life because we are applying his provision to everything that we've done. In fact, you find overwhelmingly, here's where you're going to find the greatest frustration in this, not just in my preaching. The greatest frustration you're going to find is I'm not going to ask you to do anything. I am going to ask you to think differently. I'm going to ask you to allow the word of God to renew your mind and let the Holy Spirit so provoke you to say, I've been thinking about that wrong this entire time and I need a paradigm shift so that I can begin watching Jesus Christ save me from the power of sin in me that wants me to sin all the time. Let me give you a prime example of this. Pornography is rampant in the church. I don't know necessarily that it's rampant in this church, but there's often these struggles that exist within Christians that deals with the idea that pornography is okay. It's a sin I just can't get rid of. Well, that's what it's truly like to be a man. Well, I'm just learning some things here. Well, it's not harming anybody except, you know, it's not even harming me. I'm okay. Nobody knows about this. And they bought into these massive lies that justifies their sin, has clouded their discernment between right and wrong, and leaves them in a helpless state where they're in denial. Now, trivia question. Is pornography okay? Everybody sure? So why do we have such a problem with it? Now, I'm going to give you a surprising answer. We have such problem with pornography in some situations because that's all the body can do. All the body can do is sin. That's all it does. In fact, we often call that the flesh, right? 
And the flesh wars against the spirit. And the spirit wars against the flesh so that it keeps you from doing the things that you want to do. You ask somebody who's a believer in Christ who's struggling with pornography, here's one thing that I found across the board. They don't want to, but they are. And so the question is, is how do you get deliverance? That's what we're talking about when we talk about salvation. How does Jesus Christ and all that he's done in his cross and resurrection rescue me from this terrible, terrible situation? Now, I just want to go through a little bit of this, not too much, because I don't want to get bogged down in it. Mitch, let's go to the next slide. When we talk about sins, we're talking about our conduct. But when we talk about sin, we're talking about our flesh. When we talk about sins, we talk about acts committed. But when we talk about sin, we're talking about the principle within us. When we talk about sins, transgressions that we commit, but when we talk about sin, it's a law or it's a truth that's in our members. Does everybody see the pattern that goes on here, that idea? So what happens is, is I experience forgiveness for sins. And hallelujah, that's a great thing because now I'm fully accepted by God because he sees me through Jesus Christ. But he doesn't want to stop there. He wants to rescue me from sin. Now, I'm going to say something that you might say, well, that doesn't sound right. Think about it for a minute before you condemn me. Jesus didn't die for sin think that's important for us to understand. He died for sins, but he didn't die for sin. Romans chapter 8 verse 3, look it up. But what has happened is God has condemned sin in the flesh because the flesh is no good for any of his purposes. And so while he saves us, the Holy Spirit now indwells our spirit. Our spirit is now made righteous as a habitation for the Spirit of God inside. But this body is a body of death that will result to nothing and is condemned because the flesh wants to control it and it's done for. The only victory that we have in the sense of the body is looking forward to the rapture. Why? Because this perishable will put on the imperishable. This corruption will put on incorruption. Again, notice it's God doing all the work. Everybody with me? Now, here's what's fascinating about this whole idea. I wrote this down. If you look from chapter 1 of Romans to chapter 5, verse 11, the word sin as the principle is mentioned twice. That's it. But in the short section that we're going to look at from 512 to the end of 8, it's mentioned 34 times. So he's told us about that the cross has dealt with sins and we're done with that. Now how do we deal with the principle in us that still wants to do wrong even though we're redeemed? And now he's going to spend these next three chapters answering this question. Chapter 5, verse 11. And not only this, but we exalt, we boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we now have reconciliation. And now he's going to tell us about what this looks like. Now, what you want to do now is you want to grab your chart. You want to grab your Adam and Christ chart. Because you're going to see some things that's going on with Adam and his line. And you're going to see some things that are going on as truths that happens in Christ's line. And our big idea that he wants us to recognize here is you were in this line. But Jesus has brought you now in this line. And we need to start thinking along these lines and stop thinking in these lines. Everybody with me? Who's asleep? Making sure. Does anybody need coffee? I've had a lot this morning. (laughs) All right, moving on. Verse 12, therefore, and everybody says, what's that therefore? Because we have all of these positional blessings, we're going to move forward and start with the origins of our wrong and the corrective nature of Jesus' right. Here we go. Therefore, just as through one man, sin entered into the world. Now stop. If you're marking this, the first thing you want to put down here under Adam, sorry, that's, I got that on that paper. Where's my other paper? I don't even know what's going on here. Where am I? On this one right here. The big thing you want to mark down is that sin entered the world under Adam. That's it. In fact, something that helps me in going through the text here is every time I've had the one, and it's talking about either Adam or Jesus, therefore, just just as through one man sin entered the world, I put down Adam through the one, Adam. I need to know this because it helps me keep it separated here. 
Now, everybody notice that sin is the singular, yes? What's that mean? The sin principle entered the world. Beforehand, there was no sin principle. Genesis 1 and 2, amazing. No sins existing. Everybody's at, well, both of them are having a good time. Animals are having a good time. There's lots of stuff to eat. Nobody's got any problems. Nobody, get this, nobody has been compelled to do anything wrong. They're just enjoying the presence of God. Now, I don't know about you, but I want that to be a daily reality in my life. Paul's going to tell us how that can happen, though sin still exists. Watch this. Just as through one man, Adam, the sin principle entered the world, and what's that word? Death through sin, through the sin principle. And so death spread to all men because all sin. You want to mark all and all. Now, this is important. We don't die because we've committed sins. That's important to understand. When Adam committed his sin, he introduced and welcomed in the sin principle to be something that permanently resides in people while they're living on earth and would come down through all of his progeny. That's why you and I do wrong things. It'd be really nice to just blame Adam and move on with it, wouldn't it? But there's a problem. We inherited the sin principle from him, but let's be honest, the sins are our own, aren't they? So notice, why is it that death is a reality that's connected to the sin principle? Because we want to sin, and we sin. That's the reason why. So it seems pretty cut and dry. Now notice who it touched. Death spread to how many? All. Mark it. It's important that you see this. All. It's spread to all. And notice what it says after there. Because all sinned. And why is that important? Well, you were, you were just fine until you sinned, but once that baby sins, now they're a sinner. No, 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 no. Stop, stop, stop. We are sinners by constitution. No one had to teach that child to sin. Trust me, I know. (laughs) But what sins do? Sins reveal sin. Everybody see that? You go to the doctor in order to get checked out because you've got a cough or something? It's evidence of something going on inside of you, is it not? Yes. So when they give you medicine, they're trying to treat the root, not the fruit. That's the idea. This is a problem I have with people who want to judge other people's salvations. They're just looking at the fruit. They're not looking at the root. The root's what matters. And the root of sin is what God wants to get at with us. Now, how many of us have put up prohibitive blocks to stop sinning before? I just need to pray more. I just need to read more. I just need to try harder. I just need to do better. I just need to not listen to that. I just need to not watch that. I just need to get rid of that. Does that help? No. No, you're in tug of war with your flesh, and your flesh is winning. Why is that? Because deep down, you really want to do those things. And deep down, you really want to see that thing, and you want to hear that thing. Deep down, I need salvation. I need rescue. And that's when you come to God and you say, God, you saved me from sins. Save me from myself. That's the problem. See, this is what, forgive me for this little tangent. This is what makes it so interesting about the millennial kingdom of Christ. Satan's locked away for a thousand years, yes? People still sin. Why is that? Because the problem's not Satan. Satan's just the guy that's trying to egg it on in that direction. The real problem is here. And I thank the Lord. That from Romans 5.12 to 8.39, he's going to teach us, here's how you deal with sin residing in you. Here's how you take care of it. So now we move forward, 13. For, here's our explanation, until the law, sin was in the world. But sin, notice the two singulars principle, is not imputed when there is no law. Now pause for a second. Let me help you mark it up your paper. If you want to write above the law, Exodus 20, EX period two zero, just write that because that's when it came in. When the law came in, sin was in the world. It was there. Okay. For until the law. So the point up to it, but sin as a principle is not, this word imputed is not a good word to use. 
okay? Because imputed means to credit to somebody's account. And that kind of touches on the edge of it. But the idea, and here's the thing, does everybody, everybody remember? Because I know you guys pay attention to everything I say all the time, religiously, <laughs> okay? Do you guys remember when we started talking about in Romans 4, logizomai, 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 credited, 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 credited. Everybody remember that? And it's brought up all over the place. No one remembers it. It's there. It's there in the text, okay? So I'm reminding you as a friendly way where my ego's not too damaged, the fact that it's there over and over and over. But the problem is, is this word imputed here, when we talk about the imputed righteousness of Christ, and it's been credited to us through Christ, that's not the word logizomai here. It's not the exact same word. In fact, it's a word called elego. And the idea here is to have a recorded itemized list of what you've done. You go to Walmart, you check out through the checkout thing, they hand you a receipt. We wish it was this size. It ends up being this size. Why is that? Because they've itemized everything that you've purchased so that you can go down and check and see the prices, what was taxed, what wasn't taxed, what the subtotal is and what the state tax is, and then you're done. We get it, yes? Here's what it's saying. Up until Exodus 20, there was no receipt for the bad things you'd done. There was nothing that was going to log the multiple offenses that we've created against God that were rooted out of the sin principle. They weren't there. This is an issue. So what happened in that situation? 13 runs flush into 14. Watch how it goes here. Verse 14, nevertheless, death, mark this word, reigned. From Adam until Moses. Adam, Genesis 1, yes? Moses, Exodus 20. So what's the problem here? There was no itemization of sins because there's no law to tell you that you've done wrong. But because death still existed, it told you that keeping track of your sins didn't matter because the problem was indwelling sin. Everybody see that? People still died. If there was no account of sins going on, and therefore nobody was really wrong because nobody ever told me that that was a wrong thing, nobody would have died. Everybody would have kept living. But we know that they died over and over again, regardless if a list of right and wrongs had been put forward in Exodus 20 or not. People still kicked the bucket. So now that's a problem. And it's not only that, but death reigned. Everybody see that word reigned? That's worth the circle, double underline, star, and and mark it again, okay? And why is that? Let me give you the definition of this word, reigned. To exercise authority at a royal level, or if you want to put this above it, rule. Death ruled. Death was over all things. Death was the hopeless end of all things on earth, even at that time. Now, let's be honest. We're still struggling with that now, are we not? Why are we freaked out about this virus? Because we're freaked out about death. Because if it gets me and I'm not in the most perfect help or if I can't get medical attention, I'm going to die. That's why. Because death controls us somewhat, does it not? Aren't there certain things that we don't do because we're scared of death? You know, and and don't get me wrong. uh, let's, Let's not do any stupid things, okay? We don't want to do stupid things and die. But there are some things that we absolutely avoid. There's some people we avoid because we think they'll kill us. Is that possible? I don't know your in-laws, but maybe. (laughs) Moving on. So notice this. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned. Now notice that that's in the plural. And that, that idea right there is who had not committed the same acts against God in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type who was to come. In other words, Adam had a prohibition, yes? Don't do what? Don't eat of the fruit of the tree. Was anybody else given that beyond Adam and Eve? No one was. And so notice, even though you had people down through the ages between Adam when he sinned and Moses when the law was given, they still committed wrong things. Even there, there was no list. Adam had a list of what not to do, and he still did it anyway. Does everybody see the Father's Day relation here with your child? Don't do this. Okay. And they go, where are you going? You find them doing the thing you told them not to do. And we ask the question, why don't you listen? Yes? No, who? Don't pretend like you can't sympathize with me right now, man. (laughs) Don't even. Where's my water? Good grief. 
Don't act like you can't. So the problem that we have so far is, number one, Adam's brought sin in. That's a problem. Not only that, but it's trickled down to everybody. Everybody sins because sin is indwelling them. So that's a problem. We have also that death has come in. You want to put that under the Adam category. As if sins weren't enough. As if the sin problem wasn't enough. But now you got death in the mix. Now people are going to die because of it. Not only spiritual death, of which we're all born into this world under, but also physical death will eventually get us as well. It's a twofold problem here. Now moving on. Look what it says here in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. Now, does that mean that Adam is like Christ? Well, kind of, only in the fact that they're setting up this idea of if you come from Adam's race and you stay in Adam's race, you're going to end up with Adam's ending. But if you are born into Christ's race and you follow along in Christ's race, you're going to eventually come out in Christ's way. That's the idea. Now, remember, Adam sinned, Christ did not. This is the contrast, and here's where they begin. Look at the next one, verse 15. But the free gift is not like the transgression. Okay, stop. Who brought the free gift? Jesus did. Here's your Christ category. I got something great from Jesus. I got a free gift. Adam only brought transgression. What I've got from Christ is a free gift. Now, here's the interesting thing. If the law wasn't there... How do people know what was right and wrong in their life? What is it? Say it. Conscience. This is the reason why we went through dispensations the way that we did. Because what governs people when they don't know what is right and wrong? Conscience. Just because there is not a speed limit sign for 13 miles between here and Baraboo does not give you the freedom to drive 95 on that road. How do you know that? Because your conscience will tell you that 95 is not appropriate. What is that speed limit there, Chuck, in between that little area? (laughs) It's 45 in that little area next to the gas station. Just want to let you know, Chuck's been reminded of that. So, (laughs) twice? Don't you love coming to church because you just learn stuff? (laughs) It's great. It's great. So now here we go. The contrast now is between the free gift and the transgression. If you want to know what the free gift is, it's Romans 3.24. The free gift of imputed righteousness. I mean, that's what we needed to be accepted by God, right? We needed a righteousness like his. And so the free gift did nothing to earn it. Jesus just freely gives it by his life is the idea of here, you can have a righteousness that's like God's so that you can be with God all the time. That's the free gift. In fact, if we see that mentioned down in verse 17, we'll get to that in just a little bit here. But notice, but the free gift is not like the transgression. For, here's the explanation, if by the transgression of the one, who's the one? Adam, the many died. Okay, pause. Why he uses the word many there has been debated, but let me ask you a question. How many people died because of transgression? Everyone that we know of except for Enoch and Elijah, right? And that's not a question that's under consideration here about what happened to those guys. Paul doesn't even entertain it. Therefore, we shouldn't either be uh, hypothetical thinking. It's not profitable to us whatsoever. But here's the thing. Adam sins. Everyone dies. We also, thank you, Adam. Thank you. Right? So notice, if Adam's situation worked in that way, and so you would write down here, All of us die. Notice the use of the word many here is speaking to all of us. All of us die. Christian or not, you die. It happens. We've got to deal with it. We've got to come to terms with it. We've got to wrap our minds around it when it's going to happen. But notice, much more, there's my favorite words in this book, much more did the market the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man And you you don't even have to write it down. I love it. Paul went in and wrote it in for you. Jesus Christ abound to many. Now, I'm going to make the claim that many there should be considered 
all. So in your Christ category, you would put down number one, through Christ came the gift of God. How does God, or sorry, the grace of God, how does God manifest his grace to us? He does it first and foremost on a recognizable level through Christ and what he did for us. Jesus is the perfect manifestation of grace, the undeserved favor of God. I don't ever deserve it. He freely gives it, and he gives it completely, sufficiently, without anything asking of me. That's grace. Now, notice it's two things that are mentioned here. They go together, but it's two things. Through Jesus came, excuse me, number one, the grace of God, good stuff, and the gift by the grace. What's the gift? I just told you a minute ago. Imputed righteousness. So notice he's bringing it up again. The free gift is imputed righteousness. It's Christ's righteousness credited to your account so that you are fully accepted by God at all times, regardless of what you've done, because your sins have been forgiven, okay? So notice, we not only have from Jesus the grace of God manifested, we have the gift by his grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound. Good word. It's actually derived from the word abundant. And what it means is, da 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 that's what it means. It means you're walking into a huge situation with this. It means it's overflowing. Anybody ever filled a cup to overflowing? Do it sometime. It's fun. Messy, but fun. It's good to do that. Imagine you're so thirsty from the day, been out working in the yard or something, and finally you get that ice water right? And it's just overflowing out of your mouth because you're so excited about it. I don't know how you got so messy, but still abundant, overflowing, amazing. And notice it says to the many, I'm going to go ahead and say to you, it's to all. He's made that available to all. Let me ask you the question. Who did Jesus not die for? Who was exempted? Who who did he say, you know what? I think I'm going to save this many people, but I'm going to stump right here and you people. Sorry. Sorry. Find a different way. Never. He's tasted death for every man. He's the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the entire world. Sins. He's forgiven everybody their transgressions against him. That's a powerful truth. So here's the thing. If Adam's situation is going to lead you in this direction and it's all going to go downhill, Jesus Christ wanted to make sure that he and his person counteracted this situation so he can take you up, 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 up. That's where he wants us to go. Now, moving through this, notice the next part, verse 16. The gift, what is the gift? Imputed righteousness. We're starting to catch on. I love it. The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. Who's the one who sinned? Adam, and notice sin, talking about the offense that he committed. Now look what it says here. For, explanation, on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression resulting in condemnation. Now this is huge here, and this is where a lot of the interpretive problem stands, okay? So watch this. For on the one hand, God's judgment, the judgment, that's God's response to sin committed against him. He judged Adam, did he not? He did. We see that in Genesis 3. Notice, it arose from one transgression. What is that? Adam's single sin that he committed. But here's the problem that we have. Is this little word right here resulting in condemnation. Everybody see this word, condemnation. This word condemnation is in the Greek is katakrima. And it's not just the idea that somebody's guilty, but it's the idea, the fact that a sentence has been pronounced upon them because of their guilt. So it's not just um, destined for the lake of fire now, that's bad. It's not just death is a reality for me and that's bad. No, it's the fact of because of that, you have now been sentenced in a direction that is bad. It's not just the consequence, but it's the servitude that comes out. And what we find is, is that we've been sold out to sin. Why? Because let's be honest, when Adam sat here and had a choice between what he wanted to do and what God asked him to do, he chose what he wanted over what God asked him. Therefore, he is the head of our human race who made a decision for us. See, we're not too happy with Adam right now, are we? We're just not. So this whole idea, if you want to write down of condemnation, it's a very important word to study. It is a burden ensuing from a judicial pronouncement. 
It's the idea of servitude or a punishment that follows a sentence. Or let's say it this way, because of what Adam has done, not only is death in the mix now, not only is the sin principle alive and well within me now, but I'm also now a slave to sin. I want to sin. And that's all I want to do is sin. What does this flesh do? Sin. It's got a PhD with honors in sinning. It just wants to do wrong constantly. Now, why do I tell you that? Because let me, let me add to this. Stop freaking out about your sin. Stop being just blown away by the fact that you committed sin. Is sin bad? Yes, it is. Should it be treated seriously? Yes, it was. It was treated seriously by the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. But understand this, it's been treated. It's been dealt with. It's been decisively taken care of and taken out of the mix. Didn't Jesus say it is finished? Yes. But shouldn't we feel remorseful for our sin? Let me say this so it makes you all a little weird. You can, but you don't have to. Why? Because when Jesus died, he didn't just die for my sins. He also took all my guilt and shame with him. Let me ask the question. What else is your flesh going to do? I mean, if you had to sit down and fill out your employment history, you're attaching your resume to an application. Hey, could you write down some words and tell me about what your flesh does? If it's not S-I-N in huge letters, you've missed the point. All it does is sin. All it does is want to do wrong. Why? Because I'm a slave to sin because of Adam's situation. And all I want to do is sin all the time. I'm actually a servant of sin. And even when I'm trying to do good things for other people, I still sin. Why? Because it's really about how it makes me feel. You ever realize a lot of the reason why we help people is because of the way it makes us feel, not because of really what it does for them? Why is that? Because it's sin. And because we're full of pride. And because we love doing things that make us feel good. Is it wrong to feel good? I'm not saying it's wrong to feel good. I'm saying that feeling good is the wrong motive for why we love and care for other people. That's how deep it goes. Moving on here. Notice it says here, the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the one, on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression, resulting in katakrima, resulting in our servitude or our bondage to sin. We're now in bondage under that. But, here's the transition. On the other hand, the free gift, what's the free gift? Imputed righteousness. Who's it come through? Jesus arose from many transgressions. In other words, he dealt with many transgressions through that, resulting in, or that word might be better understood as producing. Producing in us. Now it says the word justification, yes? Anybody have in their Bible translation something different besides the word justification? Anybody have the word righteousness there? No? Here's what's interesting about this word is if you were dealing with the word for justification or righteous there, you're, de- you're dealing with a Greek word, forgive me if I'm saying it wrong. Uh, dikaiuo is the idea of it. But this is actually dikaioma is what this is. And what that means, you might say, that doesn't mean a hill of beans to me. Why does that matter? Here's what it means is because what it's talking about here is not righteous standing. It's talking about righteous actions. See, now we're moving into how we live. Now, I want you to write that above there, righteous deeds, righteous action, right action, however you want to place that there. Think about what it's saying. Back up to 16 and look. The gift of imputed righteousness is not like that which came through Adam who sinned. When he committed sin, he brought sin into the world, and now we're in trouble. But on the other hand, on the, uh, sorry, on that, sorry, but on the hand, the judgment, God's response to sin arose from one transgression, resulting in our being slaves to sin now. That's the result of what happened out of that situation, and that's the boat we're in. How do we get out of the boat, God? How do we get out of the boat? It's the free gift. Imputed righteousness gets you out of the boat. Okay, how does that work? Look what it says. But on the other hand, the free gift, imputed righteousness, arose for many transgressions and paid for them in full, which is important we need to understand, producing in us right actions. In other words, because of the cross, 
And because of the resurrection, right actions are now possible within this body of death who is sold as a slave unto sin that actually overcomes the power of that servitude to sin to where I can live a righteous life for other people to see, for the edification of the church, and for the glory of God. Now, why is that a big deal? And why didn't I get any amens? I'm disappointed. But here's why it's a big deal. Because none of us could ever do that before. It was impossible. When I hear all these arguments, well, I'm a pretty good person. No, you're not. Stop it. That's one of the greatest boundaries of evangelism. People think they're already good enough. They are not. They are condemned. They are slaves to sin. They serve one master, and that is self. That's it. This is why in Romans 3, we saw there's none righteous. No, not one. Well, are you sure about what's her name next door? She's really nice. No, she is too. Anybody ever seen, uh, what is it, the Awana app that you can share the gospel with? Anybody ever seen that on your phone? You find it sometime, get it. It talks about sharing the gospel with people. It's really neat. You bring it up there and you've got this whole room of cartoon people. And you've got like, of course, they got like the real, you know, evil guy that's the drug dealer with tattoos. <laughs> but anyway, back there, you know, is, is this guy righteous? You know, is this guy good enough? And you click on him and it says, no, right? And then you move on to the next person and it's like the guy who walks his dog every day. Is this guy righteous? You click on it, no. And you got the real sweet grandmother who's got apple pie, you know, and it's like still warm. You can see the little thing he's coming off of. Is she righteous? Surely she baked pie. No, I love it. And you go down there and the answer for every one of them is no, 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 no. None. None are righteous. All of us are slaves to sin. Now, let me say this, the reason why Paul's bringing all this up and he's contrasting the Adam and the Christ thing. And and again, your Christ category, you now have imputed righteousness that can produce right acts in your life. Acts that God looks upon and he smiles at. That he says, yes, yes, thank you. Thank you for believing what I've supplied for you so that you can live a way that nobody else lives. Now, this whole comparison situation is going on here is because Paul is trying to convince us of two things. Number one, apart from Jesus and even believing in Jesus, we still need Jesus. We still need him. Paul wants to convince us that we are so weak that there is no other way to go but up. I heard a preacher say it this way. Sometimes we believe that we're weak enough to where we want to get out of the world but we're not so weak that God can use us. And so we get stuck in this stagnant middle position here. I would hope that isn't us. We're in bondage to sin, but Jesus says, I've overcome those things. And you can actually have righteous acts produced in you. Look what it says, 17. For if by transgression of the one, that's Adam, death, what's the word? Reigned, ruled. It ruled through the one, through Adam. Now stop. Do you believe that death rules? One of the greatest blights we have on our nation is abortion. Don't tell me that we're not part of a culture where death rules. We're getting news stories every day. People can't quit killing people quick enough. All you have to do is look different. I'm finding that a lot of this race situation is actually being perpetuated by people who are speaking against it rather than people who are living in the midst of it. We are a culture of death. And if that doesn't display our bondage to sin, that some people can't think of any other way, then, well, let's kill this person so we can move on with life. We're insane. We live in an insane world. And the reason is, is because it is L-O-S-T, lost. So notice, Paul's not talking about something that's all theological and otherworldly and weird and we can't gravitate towards. We understand that right now, death reigns. Death rules over everything. We see it every day. So look how it moves on here. For if by the transgression of one, Adam, death reigned through the one, through Adam in that fallen race. So death reigned, that's the Adam category. Look what it says here. Much more, those who receive... The abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. Do you remember those from up top in verse 15? The grace of God, 
and the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. But notice, those who, what's the word? Receive. How do you receive the grace of God and the righteousness of God? What is it? Believe. Notice that. If you've received it, you're rescued. If you've received it, you are a candidate for overcoming the bondage of sin, the servitude of sin. You are placed in right relationship with God and spotless in his sight, and now there's nowhere to go except up. That position of acceptance is a launching pad, is what it is. We're never trying to gain it. We've got it, and now God says, now go forward. Move up. Take everything that I've supplied for you and employ it in your life so that righteous acts flow out of you. That's where he's going with this. So notice, as death reign, those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life. What tense is that? Is it? Why can't it be both? Now, thank you, Roxanne. Now, Paul's talking about the power of sin and our servitude to sin now. What are we going to do? Be saved but struggle with sin the rest of our lives? Let me ask you the question. Would we be very happy with God's salvation if that's what the life was? Well, I'm just destined to struggle with sin until I die. That's a recipe for suicide. God doesn't want that for his kids. He wants his kids to be victorious. How do I know that? He made his son victorious and he gave us his son. Now, embrace his son. Embrace his son, not just to get you in the door, but to get you through life victoriously above the bondage of sin. So now watch where he goes with this. Those who receive it will reign in life through, there's your channel, the one, Jesus Christ. Only through him. Only. There is no other door. That life cannot have that reign through any other way. And that's often the tricks that we try to pull to make it happen. How many of us have ever thought, well, if I just read my Bible more, things will be better? Is reading your Bible good? Absolutely. We're not going to discourage it. Is praying good? Yes. But notice that all those things point you in a direction. And that's the person of Jesus Christ. So it's becoming so enamored with his person, so understanding and embracing of his person that he lifts you up over those things, frees you from that bondage. I know we're going long. Give me a second, please. (laughs) Second. Move on. So now verse 18. Verse 18, he is going to return to the argument he was making up top in verse 12. And here's how he sums it up. These are 18, 19 parallel passages. So then is through the one transgression, notice that's Adam and the sin that he committed, There resulted katakrima. There resulted not just death, but a servitude to sin. We're now all enslaved to sin. To how many men? All, all men. Even so, through one act of righteousness, who did the act of righteousness? Jesus. What was the act of righteousness? Notice it's an action. The death and the resurrection of Christ. Notice that. Through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. Acquittal. You've been vindicated. You can now have righteous acts coming from you that were never a possibility before because Christ was absent from your situation. I don't... Help me. Help help me. Help me help you. Does this make sense? Do we get this? I can actually do things that make God happy. Do you know me? (laughs) To me, that's incredible. It's remarkable. And God is actually pleased when I come to him and say, I told my wife, I said, God, I said, babe, I feel like we're coming up on Father's Day. I have no patience with my child. (laughs) She said, it's okay. I understand why we pray for patience. We know we don't have it. And we know it's a miracle of God if he were going to get it. So it's got to come from a miracle worker for us to have it. But then you realize, no, it's Jesus producing his life in me. 
And all of a sudden, there's this supernatural patience. In fact, everybody familiar with the fruits of the Spirit? Usually the women are because they did a Beth Moore study. Everybody familiar with that? <laughs> fruits of the Spirit, yes. Peace, patience, love, joy, kindness, goodness, self-control, all those things. They're against such things that are under the law. Everybody realize that it says the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruits of the Spirit? <laughs> I spit. COVID hazard right here. Didn't get you, brother. I love you. Why is that? Because when you're coming to God saying, God, there's utter helplessness in this body. And I need you to do the work. When that happens, when you've called out to him, he steps in and he saves you. And you find that not only do you have patience, but you do have love and joy and peace and self-control and goodness and kindness. And nobody can bring a law against you. Why? Because nobody can bring the law against Jesus. And when you start manifesting the presence of Jesus because of your utter helplessness in this body and your full reliance, throwing yourself at the feet of God, there's nothing wrong for a Christian to do that. This is a lordship situation. We don't need to understand his lordship to go to heaven when we die. We do need to understand his lordship if he's going to live through our life. We're talking about lordship sanctification. That's the difference there. Give me two more minutes. I'll get it. So notice, it results in right action of life to all men. Now notice, to all men, how? Remember those who receive that we saw in the previous verse? You've got to receive it in order for it to be a reality in your life. Look at verse 19. Now he's going to hone in on the people involved. For as through the one man's disobedience, that's Adam, the many were made sinners. Many probably means what here? All. And notice where it says made. That word should probably be understood constituted. I have a a sin constitution. My constitution is one of a sin principle. Even so, through the obedience of the one on the cross, that's Jesus Christ, the many will be made righteous. That's not a typo. Made righteous. You say, what, do we become Catholic all of a sudden? No. But here's, this, here's what happens. When you respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your spirit. They're two separate things. The Holy Spirit and our spirit testify that we are children to God. There's your witnesses for the authentication of salvation. We get into that in Romans 8. But in order for the Holy Spirit to dwell there, there has to be righteousness dwelling. So when he comes in, he cleans house. And you know the great thing that the Spirit does when it meets up with our spirit is he kicks the sin nature out, evicted, gone. Move on out of here. Why do our flesh still sin? Because that's all we know. That's how we've been trained. That's how the world moves us along. But we don't have to say yes to it any longer. Why? Because we've actually been made righteous in our spirit. Our spirit is where God dwells inside of us. Do you recognize that the Holy Spirit dwells in you? Christ dwells in you. Do you get that? There's the place where these righteous acts come forward. Why? Because they're his acts, not mine. So moving on here, verse 20. The law... Why has he got to bring the law back in? The law came in so that the transgression would increase. And you say, thank you, God. Is that a good thing? Why does he do that? Why did he want to enlarge our sin? Because well, his, well, his grace abounds more than that. But here's the reason why. Because notice that Paul brings this up. And the reason why God did this is because we're really not convinced that we're terrible, awful people. Here's what we do. We're, we're like the guy, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like this person over here. I thank you that I don't look like them. I don't act like them. I don't work that silly job that they do. And we bring smug self-righteousness to God because our comparison is with other people. Until you compare yourself to the model of Jesus Christ, you'll never recognize how desperately you need him. And that's for the Christian. That's not just the non-Christian. That's a Christian thing that we need. That's a born-again thing. So notice it says here, the law came in so that the transgression would increase. Now, I thought about doing this to make you understand. I was going to strum an acoustic guitar. So everybody hear that? And then I was going to turn that amplifier up as loud as it would go. And I was going to give you a big Pete Townsend one of these. <laughs> and I was going to watch all your hair do this. That's what it looks like when you bring the law in. The law makes your sin known. Here's where you're wrong. 
say, gosh, I can't get away from it, can I? No, because God knows everything. But here's the beauty. Don't miss the beauty. Don't get depressed and miss the beauty. Here's where it is. Look what it says. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Darby's translation is it overabounded. The people in the back went in the dark. Somebody move around and click on the light. It's a motion light. Thank you, Michaela. Beautiful. I think that was like a ballet step. I'm not for sure. Grace abounded. It overabounded. The idea here is it superabounded with more added to that, is what one translator said. However bad you think your sin is, grace is greater. However far you think you've drowned in sin, you haven't drowned enough in grace because it goes deeper. You never out the grace of God. Well, my sin's too terrible. I can't come to him. No. Your sin's exactly why he died and why he invites you. If you didn't have sin, you couldn't come to him because you wouldn't need him. So the law comes in and says, you need him. Oh my gosh, I'm such a terrible person. I need him. And he made the way possible by super overabounding his grace in every measure towards you. That's great. Do you believe it? Thank you. Do you believe it? I don't know about you, but thinking about that grace is greater than my sin. I know my sin. Do you know your sin? Grace is greater. Well, shouldn't we be upset about our sin? I'm still tripped up what you said earlier. No, why? Because grace is greater. Grace is greater. Grace is greater. If the mantra of the church should be anything, it's regardless of what goes horrible, stop focusing on that junk. Grace is greater. Because if all we are is bogged down by our sin, we are essentially throwing off the molding hands of Christ and saying, I don't need you. He says, well, don't you understand my grace is greater? Yes, but I don't feel like, oh, there's the train out playing in the weeds again. Moving on here. Let's finish this up. Verse 21. Here's the reason. As death, sorry, as sin principle reigned in death, even so, what's the word? Grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And this word righteousness here is in such a form that it's a quality or a characteristic of upright behavior. In other words, here's what he's saying. Because grace starts manifesting itself and righteousness begins producing out of you, what you actually find is that there is a quality of life that Jesus brings into your existence that you never could have seen before. It's not anything you achieve. It's what's manifested through you. Now, here's the reason why it says grace will reign and not righteousness will reign. Because if we start to see in our lives that righteousness is reigning, we start to sit back and and we do this. Don't lie. Hey, I'm doing pretty good with the Lord lately. Right? I've really been reading my Bible like, man, gangbuster. I'm just learning so much. It's so good. I, 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 I. Where do we think the righteousness is coming from? Guess what? That righteousness becomes a form of pride of which we look down and judge our brothers and sisters in Christ because they're not as right on as we are. You know what grace does in the midst is being the reigning factor? It keeps you humble in the midst of God's growth of you. That's the difference. It has to be grace that reigns. God wants grace to reign in every single one of us. Now here's the frustrating part of this sermon. I'm not asking you to do anything. I don't have any application for you on this. What I do have is a very solid and sober reminder that Jesus just didn't take care of your sins issue. He also took care of your sin issue. And the greatest thing that we can ever do is come to him and say, God, I can't do it. I don't have the answers. In fact, I'm becoming more acutely aware of my weakness the more I walk with you. And you know what he says? Thank you. Thank you for admitting the fact that you can't live this life and you need me to live it. And then watch grace reign. That's the difference. Let's pray. Father, thank you that regardless of the terrible nature of sin, regardless of the death that seems to rule our culture, and often rules over our lives. You have rescued us from that sad ending. And you have set us on an entirely different plane. Father, if we've had conflict or mistrust issues with you in our daily life, 
Lord, that those things would be corrected now, please, in our thinking. That we would recognize that Jesus Christ is all we need. That in every situation we face, Jesus Christ is the solution. That in every question that we have, Jesus Christ is the answer. We need more of Christ every single day. Father, convince our hearts. If we don't believe that we're still bound up in sin and still servants of sin and that our body will just do nothing but sin, Father, we need conviction of the Holy Spirit. Paul preaches it to us solidly. And it's because of the greatness of our sin that we need that abounding of Jesus Christ working through us. Thank you that grace is greater than our sin. How incredible it is that you love your people in this way. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.